Good afternoon and welcome to Love Money and Contract Training with Greg Sertman. It's a beautiful summer's afternoon here and we are just delighted that Greg has joined us. Chuck, if you would like, please give us a quick intro. A bit intro. Well, again, uh, many of you may know Greg through his work in contract training. Uh, he's been involved in contract training for a number of years. I've gotten acquainted with him over the years through uh, professional meetings and through his relationship with Kathy Yeager, who was from Kansas and was also one of the starters of the contract training edge. So, uh, but at the recent Ohio meeting, heard Greg and I really felt that what he had to share would be excellent for our ACEWARE partners and for also folks that we have in our contact list. Uh, just by way of background, if you haven't had a chance to get to know him, he's been a contract trainer, director of business development for Cuyahoga Community College and an account executive for New Horizons, growing accounts in Northeast Ohio with his 16 years of experience. Uh, just looking at the numbers, he says over 4,700 sales calls and generated more than 17 million of contract services revenue. So I think if, if he can do that, um, let's pay attention to him and see how we can help our contract training proceed. And uh, before, Greg, I turn you loose for ACEWARE users. Um, obviously, we're happy you're here. If you're not an ACEWARE user, we're welcome. I do want to mention that we do have support for contract training programs built into our ACEWARE product. So if you're not if you do contract training and have ACEWARE and you're not using some of those elements, um, get with Lori and I. We'll show you the webinar in the webinar archive uh, where you'll be able to learn about it and uh, actually even extend what you're able to do with your student manager. So Greg, that was my little bit of uh, sponsor ad. We're going to let you tell us about contract training. All right, well, thanks, Chuck, and thanks, Lori. And I also want to thank ACEWARE Systems for, uh, for hosting this uh, webinar. And I want to thank you all for an hour of your time here. Um, my intent over the next hour is to really share with you a lot of the best practices that I have, uh, have gathered throughout the uh, 16, 17 years that I've been in this business. And also what I've seen uh, being with Contract Training Edge over the last year, year and a half. So I have my top 10 here, and I kind of want to elaborate on that with you. And I also wanted to warn you, I do have a handful of kind of questions for you integrated into this presentation, so I'm going to ask that you uh, uh, at some times raise your hand. I even have a, a, a multiple choice qu a question for you a little bit down the road. Well, as Chuck had stated, uh, I spent my last 16 years um, with New Horizons Computer Learning Center and Cuyahoga Community College, which is the oldest and largest community college in, in, uh, in the state of Ohio. I really cut my teeth on this business with New Horizons Computer Learning Center where um, we, we sold IT training to large organizations here in Northeast Ohio. And I was, um, I was able to work my way up to the top rep here in Cleveland. And uh, I was contacted by the college about six years into my career at New Horizons and learned a little bit more about what they were doing with this corporate college concept, which um, didn't know it at the time, but it was the first corporate college that was launching in the United States at that time. So needless to say, I got in on the ground floor as the first 100% per salesperson at a, at a college, which was a very program-focused organization at the time. So over the, past 10, or over the past 10 years, between 2003 and 2013, I had built a centralized sales function within that program-focused organization and was able to sell personally a little bit over $11 million in contract training as well as um, hiring, developing, coaching other salespeople to, um, to also sell contract training revenue. So it's really these experiences that I have put together uh, and wanted to share with you today. Uh, so number one, let's, uh, let's go ahead and dive right into it. When I work with teams across the country um, and I ask them what, who their top accounts are, uh, some of you may have referred to them as your best accounts, top accounts, strategic accounts. Um, I get a lot of different answers, frankly. So what I do is I help these teams really have a shared understanding on what a top account is. And I like to look at it through uh, three different metrics. Uh, the first metric is an engagement metric, which is 
um, how many different services are we selling to that organization? And if it's only one, why is it only one? How can we expand that to be two, three, four, five, six different services? There was uh, one of my best clients, the, the Cleveland Clinic. I would have as many as six or seven different engagements going at the same time with that organization. Um, so that's, that's metric number one. Metric number two is just revenue, just gross revenue. How much did I sell that organization in the last fiscal year? And the third metric is that sustainability metric. I know that, um, and I've had some of these accounts where they would do business with you one year, and then they would fall off the face of the earth for the next year or two, perhaps because you, they, they don't have a need, you're not getting to the right people. If they're addicted to a grant, maybe you don't have that grant available. So my point here is to really stay engaged with that organization. So it's generating at least X amount of in gross revenue over the past perhaps two, three, four fiscal years with at least one to three transactions in each of those fiscal years. So that's really the, uh, the sustainability metric. So these different metrics may look different for different business groups across the country. So that's when I work with Intact teams, we really spend some time to really help define that. And after we have a shared understanding around what we want our metrics to be, then, then I ask the question, how many top accounts do we feel we have today? And then we work from that perspective. And I'll go ahead and segue into number two best business uh, development practice is to have a business development strategy. We just talked a little bit about top accounts. Well, my, my point here is let's, let's have more top accounts now that we've defined um, what a top account is. So in creating a business development strategy, I think it's very important to involve the entire team in the process. So it's not just the leader of the group basically sitting in a room and figuring out and then kind of dictating it to, to the team. I, I like to see the, the entire team involved in the process, even if you're not in a sales role, if you're a program leader or a coordinator or whoever. I'd like to get everyone's fingerprints all over this plan. And I also like to talk about transitioning from defense to offense. So what I mean by that is to not just rely on a lot of the incoming calls, incoming activity, incoming referrals um, from organizations and being much more proactive and intentional about who we're doing business with. Um, I also like to, with the intact teams, prioritize industry sectors in your, in your area. And what I found in working different areas of the country, different areas of the country prioritize industry sectors differently. For example, when I was down in Houston, uh, their number one industry, industry sector is petrochemical. And when I was up in Wisconsin, uh, that wouldn't even show up on the top seven or eight. So it, it, is, it is somewhat different in different areas of the country. Then I really like to spend some time and really identify what we feel our top 10, I'm sorry, our top 100 potential top accounts could be. So let's say, for example, we went through that top accounts exercise and figured out that we had 10 accounts that met the top account criteria. Our, our next piece of work is really identifying as many accounts as possible that we feel have the potential of becoming a top account. And you know, a lot of factors come into play, like number of employees, what industry sector they're in. And I've also heard other criteria across the country, like how many, um, how many good experiences we've had with that organization, say, in the past three years, um, how many connections that, that are known that we have to leverage both internally and externally. Um, maybe their revenue uh, is something that we pay attention to. So there's lots of different criteria, and we may choose to weigh that criteria differently as we ultimately determine who our top 100 or 50 potential accounts are. And then let's focus the majority of our time on those accounts and pay much less of time on those accounts that um, uh, don't meet that criteria. Even if it's the account that's calling in. I always joke about the 10-person uh, the, uh, plumbing organization that's calling in because they want a team building event. But we have to be very careful about the amount of time that we're spending with those kind of accounts because they're not going to ultimately be able to um, give you the kind of revenue uh, that we're looking for over time. 
So, and then when you, when, once you get that strategy in place, we want to talk about specific team goals and metrics. And when we talk about team goals, the easy number to talk about is typically how much revenue we think we're going to bring in this fiscal year, next fiscal year, three years from now. But I also like to pay attention to a lot of those non-revenue metrics. And those could be things like uh, number of client touches. A client touch to me is not only just maybe a face-to-face -face meeting, but maybe it's a conference call with two of them and two of us on a phone kind of talking through a business issue or a potential solution, but it's moving uh, the sales process one step forward. Um, other things that we can talk about as far as metrics go are maybe number of proposals that we're, that, that, that we're presenting and number of contracts that are signed, conversion ratio, number of training events that we're delivering. So there's all kinds of different metrics that, that we can pay attention to. So I like to work with teams to identify maybe three or four of those metrics. And then when we have our team meetings, maybe it's every other week, those are things that we're paying attention to every, every time that we get together as, as a team. Um, and then those team goals ultimately drill down into individual goals and individual action plans. Um, engage your executive team. I, it's been my experience that I've, got, I've been able to get in front of um, many high-level people through the leaders at my college. But you have to be very proactive about building relationships with those leaders at your college so they can ultimately feel comfortable about opening up their black book and introducing you because they're they're confident. I mean, they may feel good about the mission of the college, which I hope they would, but they also have to feel very comfortable about about you and your ability to take care of clients. So, and, and that happens through relationship building with those leaders at your college. And then at the end of the day, it just comes down to execution. It's going out there and, and you know and spending 10% of your efforts building that plan and 90% of your efforts going out there and executing that plan. Number three, best practice in business development is understanding our client style and knowing that there are at least four different unique styles, buying styles that clients have. And then we have to um, build some engagement strategies that are going to basically cover this. So the DISC assessment is something that I really like. It's a behavioral-based assessment that I encourage everyone who I work with to go through uh, prior to or as part of going through a two-day workshop or my helping them from a coaching. So what I like to do is have you understand your own sales style, understand that there are four unique client buying styles, and then get comfortable with at least one to two engagement strategies for each of these buying styles. And that's um, where we make that unique connection with our client. So I have a little exercise I'd like you to go through. And uh, um, Lori, if you want to just kind of give folks a little bit direction on um, the outcome of this exercise is you telling us what style you are as far as, it, as, far as your buying style. All right. Shall I launch the poll for you? Yes. Go ahead and launch the poll. Um, so here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to make a, a, a decision whether you are fast-paced and outspoken or cautious and reflective. You have to choose one of those two. If you choose fast-paced and outspoken for yourself, I want you to kind of visually put yourself on the top of the circle here. And if you're cautious and reflective, put yourself at the bottom of the circle. OK, now for the folks that have decided that they're fast-paced and outspoken, I'm going to ask you whether you are either questioning and skeptical or accepting and warm. If you are questioning and skeptical, then you are a D. If you are ex more accepting and warm, then you are an I. Now I'm going to kind of go back to the folks who I've identified themselves as cautious and reflective, who are at the bottom part of that circle. And I'm going to ask you the same question. If you feel you're more questioning and skeptical, go ahead and tag yourself as a C. And if you feel you're more accepting and warm, go ahead and tag yourself as an S. So after you've kind of worked through that through, go ahead and uh, submit it uh, via the poll which style you are, either a D, I, S, or C. I can see people changing their mind as, as we 
as they consider this a little bit. Yeah, and when you change your mind, that's telling me that you're probably on the fence uh, with one of those two things. So um, if you were to take the full blown out version of this assessment, uh, it would take you about 10 to 15 minutes and you'd, you'd have a 25 page report about yourself and the different styles out there and how, how you make connections. Um, so you're likely to be close to one of those lines if you're having a trouble making decisions. But for the purpose of this exercise, I'm asking you to do, do, to do your best. Okay, and we're going to close the poll in three, two, one. There it goes, and I will share the results with you. Greg, I think you can see the results on your Citrix tool panel on the far right, but I will tell you that 18% said they were D's, fast-paced. 29% uh, said I, fast-paced and accepting. We had 53% that said they were blues, accepting and warm and cautious at the same time, and nobody went for yellows. Wow, no, no yellows. No yellows, not a one. Nobody was even on the fence about it. I was surprised because not one vote, not one vote changed. <laughs> Nobody considers themselves a yellow. All right. Well, let's kind of walk through real quick. I'm not going to spend too much time with each one, but to tell you what each of these quadrants mean. So let's start with the Ds. Here's what we know about the Ds. Their, their priorities are results, action, and competency. And they're most concerned about the what. Um, so we have, and, and I guess, Try and think about it in terms of your clients now. So some of these client behaviors are they're very assertive, fast-paced, action-oriented. Uh, they want to get done, things, things done very quickly. Um, they're willing to take risks. They're not very um, content with small talk. They're like, they like to control discussions, and they like to make very quick, decisive actions. And you can probably think of some of your clients who fit that style, I'm guessing. Um, here's what we know about what's, what it takes or what, what, how we can increase our effectiveness to selling to these D type of customers. We know what bothers them is wasting time, small talk, too many details, indecisiveness, and challenging their authority. That's, a, that, that's what bothers them. So given all that information, our strategies to engage a D customer would be to be confident and get to the point provide immediate feedback for them, give them some options and a sense of control, respect their authority, and demonstrate business results. Um, so even though if we're not a D style, so if you are, if you did tag yourself as a D, it's actually much easier for a D and D to work together because that's the kind of style that you have. But if you happen to be an S, which is the majority of the folks here on this webinar are, we may have to change our style a bit to be able to um, connect with a D type of client better. So that's the D. Let's move over to the I. Our eyes are our I clients tend to be upbeat, enthusiastic, have a positive outlook on life, very friendly. Um, they rely on their gut or, 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 or intuition. They're also fast and action oriented. Um, they love forming personal relationships. They consider other people's feelings. They love meeting new people, and they love new ideas and adventure. And we know about the eyes that they love to tell stories, too. Um, so they prioritize enthusiasm, action, and relationships. And they're usually most concerned about the who when it comes to, uh, cl when it, when it, when it comes to client initiatives. So what bothers them is dull analysis, too many details, cold or detached people, uh, negative negativity and pessimism. So given all that, where we may want to adjust our style when we're working with I clients is to use an upbeat and lively approach. Let them tell their stories. You know, sometimes um, we may not, especially, okay, you, you Ds, you may not want to tell and share longer stories, but if we're working with a, an I client, we may have to listen to a 20-minute story in the first part of our sales meeting, although we're not going to gather a lot of meaningful data from our perspective from that story, we still need to listen to that story. Um, and the reason why is we want to build a relationship with that person. We want to show empathy for their concerns. We want to use references and case studies. Uh, we want to be open to sharing information about ourselves. 
and we want to focus more on the bigger picture and not drill down into the details. The, okay, here's the, we're going to have fun with this one because 50-some percent have yes style here. So um, you folks are typically agreeable and have a welcoming manner. You have soft, softer speech. You have a moderate methodical pace. You're calm. You know, you, you're modest and accommodating. You're reluctant to commit quickly. You're cautious or hesitant to make quick decisions. And uh, so let's just stop there for a second. When they're, if they're unable to make decisions quickly, we have to maybe slow down the pace a little bit on how quickly we're presenting data to them. We have to give them some time to let it sink in. And we got to know that our sales process is likely going to be a little bit longer with an F than it will, say, for example, with a D. Uh, the S's are most concerned about how things impact people, and their priorities are sincerity, relationships, and dependability. The S's are typically bothered by pushy people, conflict, uncertainty, unpredictability, pressure, and sudden change. And when I'm engaging with an S customer, I typically like to show warmth and sincerity, use a casual, low-pressure approach present information step by step, give them time to process the information, uh, provide reassurance, and then give it time to earn, take time to earn their trust. Last but not least, we, we have no C's on the webinar, but we know we have C, C type of, uh, of buyers out there. So the C's are typically your, your data folks. They are professional, they're slow, methodical pace, they rely on logic and reason. Um, they're not big on the emotional thing. Uh, they have discomfort with small talk or personal questions, so we don't want to share stories. Even if we're an I or an S, we want to uh, keep those to a minimum. And we want to be very caution, cautious when making decisions uh, with them because these are the kind of folks that want to have all their ducks in a row and have all the data on the table before they make decisions. So I typically, when I'm working with C-style clients, like to put things in spreadsheet format so they are, because um, uh, that's what they like to review. They're bothered by e strong e emotional or logical people, high pressure, overly enthusiastic presentations, which, which us eyes like to give sometimes. Um, and then strategies to engage with the C's is to use a, a, an objective approach, go through the details, use spreadsheets, use logic and evidence. Uh, so that's the uh, that's the style thing, and I always li like to say this: if you only have a hammer to connect with someone else, and everything else is going to look like a nail, and just to have lots of different tools in your toolkit when you go out there and identify someone's style, pull out the appropriate tools to be able to make that individual connection with that person. Uh, best practice number four is to identify and prioritize business issues, because therein lies the opportunity. It's been my experience that um, uh, decision makers out there typically like to talk about business issues in the form of either pr challenges and problems or pain, or they like to talk about goals and results, which is the gain. It's been my experience that most customers like to talk about pain or problems uh, it, it, to the tune of about 90% of them. Um, but you know that it's important for us to get them talking about either side of that. So whether they're talk, if, they, if they want to talk problems and challenges, we want to challenge them to talk about what their goal or desired result is. So the, um, the goal is if you can have them talk about current state and future state, we will be able to identify what that gap is and build some value around that gap to understand the value of the issue. Uh, here's a, just an appreciative inquiry approach to a question I like to ask early in the process after you after you go through that rapport building and make a connection with them. I'm interested in learning a little bit more about your employee development initiatives in 2015. Are you open to sharing those with me? And just to kind of see what happens and what they throw out there. Now, that being said, it's really nice to try and do some research on that person or that organization to figure out if you can find out there if there's anything going on with that organization. And I I it's very common for me to use that in my opening opening line as well. The goal here is to get as many business issues on the table as possible. And 10 minutes into a, your initial meeting, you may be in a situation where they're throwing things out there like, 
yeah, we have leadership issues and we need some IT training and we'd like to get a couple Lean Six Sigma Green Belts in place and we have some technical training needs in our maintenance department. So th that's a lot to, to kind of throw out there in the first 10 or 15 minutes of a meeting. I'd like to come back with a question like this. I'm sure all of these issues are important to your business. Of the four issues you just mentioned, which ones would you consider wildly important and which ones would you like to talk about today? Um, the reason why I ask that is because um, those business issues may have different priorities, and I want to talk about priority number one. Uh, that's the is that's the business issue they're most likely to spend money on. So, if I only have an hour, hour and a half with that person, I want to talk about that high priority business uh, business issue. Business development practice number five is this is the hardest thing I typically ask people to do is to back off that solution. So. When you're 10 minutes into that meeting and you hear things like, yeah, we have leadership issues, we want to train our 30 managers on these seven competencies, or we want to get these green belts trained, um, that's very exciting to hear. And what, what typically happens, and this is part of human nature, we start getting excited. Um, and we start, when we start getting excited, we can't wait to talk about how good we are at these different areas that they're talking about. So if they say something like, we want to train our 30 managers in these seven things, we may have a tendency to say, well, we do leadership training. We, have, we do conflict management. We have coaching. We have change management, priority management, um, team building, and you're starting to list off competencies. You're talking about the different curriculum vendors that you have. We have this kind of content. We have DDI, Achieve Global, the quality group. We have Oh, we have lots of different instructors in there. Let me tell you about them. We could deliver this at your place, or let me tell you about our locations. So what, what happens is you start talking about your stuff, and they just start tuning out in the process. So if we can discipline ourselves to back away from the solution when we hear those trigger statements, now we can transition to best practice number six. This is what we want to do after we back off the solution. Gather evidence and impact data. Uh, evidence data is simply trying to define the business issue and trying to identify examples. The simplest question that you can ask, and this typically, this is the basic question that works for just about everything. So when they say, we want to de develop 30 leaders, you come back with, what's happening? <laughs> what's going on? You want to hear them elaborate on a couple stories about what's going on. Or if you want to get more specific, you can ask a question like, what behaviors are you seeing from your, from your frontline managers? You want to get as many of those stories as possible. And then after you get those pieces of evidence on the table, now you want to get the impact. And impact is really turning the evidence into something that's tangible. So how is this business issue impacting? My four favorite type of things to talk about are cost, revenue, productivity, and customer satisfaction. And why I like to ultimately tie to one or more of these four items is that you can measure that. And if I can measure that, I'm in really good shape. So I'll come back with a question like, what kind of impact is this, and this, in this case the behavior, in, uh, having on productivity? And let them talk about that for a little while. And then ask them how they're measuring productivity, um, both currently and what they would like that to be. Um, that's where you get down to the, I mean, this, this is the meat on the bone that we really need to get in order to uh, go back and design and develop the right solution for them. So negative impact data usually looks like this. It's, it's usually the folks who like to talk about challenges and problems, and there's usually a negative impact on these four metrics right here. And then on the converse side, for folks who like to talk about goals and desired results, it's talking about the impact from a more positive perspective. Either way is fine. It's whichever. Um, whichever direction the client would like to talk about first. What our job is to, if they want to start with on the negative side here, we want to ultimately take them to the positive side so we can realize what that gap is. Number seven business practice is uh, to discuss a needs analysis. And I think this is really important um, because this process, and I, I learned these from my organizational development colleagues early on in about 2003 to 2005, is if we do this really well, we have all the right information we need to design and develop the right solution. So 
when I typically leave a meeting with a decision maker and I'm gathering all that data from that person, that's fantastic. But my, my point is I need to hear um, different people's perspective on the same issue because if I don't do that, I'm absolutely aligning my success towards everything that that one decision maker is telling me. And they may not be right. And it's been my experience is that they may have a different perspective on the issue than most of the other people in the organization. So this needs analysis really kind of flushes that out. So what I think about when I'm leaving a meeting is, and I usually try to get buy-in from the decision maker, is who are those other stakeholders that I need to talk to based on the type of issue that we've been talking about? Um, usually I like to get in front of the learners involved, um, other managers or executive leaders, frontline personnel, and even sometimes customers and suppliers. Um, then I need to think about what, 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 which ways am I going to be able to collect data? What methods of data collection are out there? So I usually think about focus groups and interviews and uh, surveys. And if it's a customer service type of issue, I usually like to um, have them provide me with an opportunity to walk the client experience. And then lastly, what should we ask them You know, when we're in front of these other learners or other decision makers or uh, frontline personnel? We want to ask them about the issue, what prevents success from their perspective, what success should look like from their perspective, and then what they feel would be helpful. And what this process does is gets every, a lot of different people's fingerprints all over this. And once we're able to collect all this data and bring it back, it kind of tells us a story about what's really going on. And once we know what's really going on, we have the keys to the kingdom as it relates to putting the right uh, solution together. And we're going to really nail it right, right on the head. Uh, I'm going to come come back and ask you guys a question here. Who is um, currently uh, comfortable with or implementing a needs analysis like I described here? So go ahead and raise your hand on the uh, Citrix dashboard if you are doing that currently. And I'm going to have Lori kind of report out on how many folks are out there doing this already. On the left-hand side, there's a little toolbar that juts out from the main toolbar, and it's got a little hand on it. If you click on it once, the fingers go up in the air, all the fingers. This is a clean show. And then if you click on it twice, your hand is raised and lowered. So if you would, click to raise your hand. And don't do it twice. If you want to vote, your vote won't count. And let's see about how many people have raised their hand. Well, you've got about 10% of folks have their hands raised. And it's going yeah. up, so okay, great. Taking a little while to commit. Yeah, folks, I'm telling you, this this made a huge difference in my in my revenue and even in my client relationships. Because if you, this is a pretty deep level of analysis uh, that you're doing for, for example, a leadership opportunity. And if you're in a competitive situation, it's, it's likely your competitors are not doing this. So this, this is a difference maker right here. And if we can get lots of people involved at the organization to add their input and get their fingerprints all over this. And this also creates a lot of pressure um, within the organization to take action. Uh, for example, if you're talking to, you know, call it 20, 30 other people through focus group surveys or interviews uh, as it relates to that issue, and then no action is taken, usually get some pressure from those folks who were involved in focus groups to go to their leaders to say, hey, we just met with this you know, folks from the college, and we kind of told them what was going on, and we were wondering where, where that's at. And uh, it, it, you know, it creates that, it's create that internal pressure to, create, uh, to, to take action. It also creates a, a level of buy-in just from the process. So if, the, if people feel like they've uh, been able to add value to a situation, they're likely to be attached to it and want to see, see that succeed. So they're likely, you're likely to build a lot of allies in this process. So I would encourage you to really uh, take a look at this and you know, give me a call if you want to talk this through in more and more detail. But the folks in the colleges that do this real well tend to have um, n not necessarily more contracts, but their contracts that they are selling are much larger. Um, so you, I, you, know, you can turn a $2,000 team building event until, let's say, a multi-competency program that's, say, 25 grand that, that lasts six to seven months. 
and then to be able to and, and to be able to replicate that with different leaders within that organization over years, um, which is which is which is great. Number eight best business development practice um, is to celebrate and promote our success. So. And I'm not saying celebrate success for every single thing that you do. Don't certainly don't do it for a, a one day or half day Excel class. But for a lot of those programs that I know that we all do, like multi competency leadership programs, a Lean Six Sigma Green Bell, a technical certification that takes a couple months to complete. Let's make it a big deal that these folks have graduated and finished. And you know, I I started pushing this about maybe seven years ago at our college, and I have found that it's a nice way to get all the stakeholders back engaged and to really understand the ROI on the engagement that just happened. And it also is, in my mind, the next sales call. So these graduation events, typically, I, you know, I, I'm the one to kind of coordinate it or push it, and I encourage to have keynote speakers. So that would be a person at a high level at the organization um, I usually bring on, bring with me someone at the college who says a little thing about lifelong learning and have punch and cake. Sometimes I'm the person who rings the punch and cake. Um, but the most impactful part of the graduation event is to get a couple students to talk about their experience and how it's impacted them um, as it relates to their job role. And uh, that's where folks are, when, when, when you're listening to these student testimonials, you know, leaders are watching them, and they're hearing, and I mean, they're really seeing in front of their eyes the difference that's making within their organization, which inspires them to take more action, whether it's further development for that group or to think about other people in the organization that needs to go through a similar experience. I'm also a big fan of co-branded certificates for these type of engagements, where uh, the the company's logos on it, our college logos on it, is signed by a high-level person on each side. And it's uh, presented to the uh, the graduates at, at at the graduation event. And in some cases, for frontline staff, I've even had uh, patches made that are sewn onto their uniform. And you see an example of that on the uh, slide here. Also, so that's all internal within the organization, but it's also important to promote success outside the organization. So when you put something together that really kind of knocks it out of the ballpark for someone, you know, think of some ways that you can capture the essence of that project whether it's written testimonials, um, co-branded marketing material. Um, we put together a handful of third-party type of art articles that ended up in business publications. And we we're a big fan of just, just sending our video team out there to interview a few folks and a few students and capturing the essence of it that and that way. This way, now we have marketing tools. So if, if you capture the essence, and I'm not saying do all four of these for every successful engagement, but try one for each of them. And what you're going to find is you're going to build an inventory of marketing material that's, that's very relevant to specific type of opportunities. So this notion around account transferability is if I, can't, if I did something really, really well at this hospital system that impacted some really important metrics, well, it's likely that I, I should be having a conversation with the other two or three healthcare systems in my marketplace to have conversations about similar metrics because We've already proven that we can move the needle on metrics that are important in, in healthcare. So that's that notion of around uh, of, of around account transferability. So um, I'm going to ask the question again: How many of you have done something like this before? Uh, and let's go ahead and just focus in on graduation events. How many of you would say are very proactive about having these type of graduation events for? programs that are more than a few days. Go ahead and just raise your hand if you're already doing this. I'm just curious to, to, to know how many folks are doing this today. You, you remind me of something my boss one time told me. He said you should always make people feel like they had been somewhere when they've been to training. And yeah, about thirty percent of our audience is doing something like that. Yeah, doing a graduation. That that's fantastic, and uh, you know, so those of you who are not, you know, can consider it and put your toe in the water and try it once. Um, you know, I think you'll be amazed with uh, the type of excitement that you'll be able to witness and 
what that means from a sales business development perspective as far as inspiring decision makers to take more action, whether it's expanding scope on that initiative or um, tackling a different initiative for that organization. So thank you for your response on that. Uh, number nine is uh, failure management. And uh, anyone in sales um, is going to be successful in sales and business development needs to be able to manage this the right way. And I'd, I use the example of Kenny Lofton here. He's one of my favorite baseball players here at the Cleveland Indians back in the late 90s. And he's a fantastic baseball player. I expect him to make the be in the Baseball Hall of Fame someday. But Kenny Lofton failed seven out of ten times at the plate over his 17 career, so his 17 year career. So here's someone who is one of the best baseball players in the history of baseball, and he failed 70 percent of 70 percent of the time. I'm not suggesting that we fail 70 percent of the time, but I can tell you that for every win that I've talked that I big deal that I have won over my career, I can talk about a deal that I have not won over my career. So we, we got to be able to manage failure and either learn from it very quickly and have a very short memory and let that roll right off our back because the fact is that we're in a business where we're going to fail sometimes. And uh, we, we have to be okay with that. And we have to let it roll off our back and think about what's next. What's that next opportunity? If I'm going to lose one, I need to put three more in the pipeline so I can get one or two out of three of those. Um, and our success is highly determined a, a, around our ability to move forward quickly after we fail. And that's true. You know, I, I coach a lot of youth sports, lacrosse, football, baseball, basketball. And when I work with these kids, um, it's a lot about their confidence and their ability to, to um, be okay with failing and moving on from that. So if I can, I pay a lot of attention to that in, in youth sports, and I think it applies to our business. So if you spend a lot of time in business development in this business, and you're, you know, you're presenting lots of different solutions to different clients, you're going to have, and I'm telling you, after a 17-year career in this, um, at a pretty good rate, you know, I think I did pretty good at selling around $17 million dollars, I've probably lost about 16 to 17 million dollars worth of proposals um, in winning that. So I just wanted to put that in perspective with you and basically let you know it's okay to fail. We should actually embrace it, and uh, if we learn how to manage it better, we can actually um, cr um, create higher levels of success for ourselves. So that's what I wanted to say about failure. And number 10, last but not least, is to invest in ourselves. We're in the business of developing other people and organizations. That's our business. And we need to kind of practice what, what, what we preach. And we need to do that every single year. So uh, learning more about ourselves and others, I know can significantly improve the performance of our team. And we can do that through that DISC assessment, which I'm a big fan of, because they have the, um, the sales flavor to that. Um, I'm also encouraging you to take, if you're going to pick up a book, a lot of what I presented today and my philosophy around sales is built around this, this book that I'm showing here, Let's Get Real or Let's Not Play by Mahan Klasa. Um, Mahan is the founder of the Franklin Covey Sales Performance Group uh, with, with the, sales, the Franklin Covey organization. And I had an opportunity to go through his program back in the early 2000s. And I, have over the years, applied his principles, techniques, and tools to our business. And I can tell you, it's, it, it, it hits it right on the head. Um, never stop being a student of the game and take ownership of your own development. So what I did a lot of my last five or six years at the college was I embedded myself into a lot of contract training events that, that I sold to clients. So, and you kind of accomplished three things by doing that. You learn more about the specific subject matter, and which ultimately will help you sell it. You can apply what you've learned towards our own businesses, like Lean Six Sigma. Um, and then we're strengthening our relationship with that particular client because we're, to, you know, we're probably spending more time with them. And I usually like to embed myself where the decision maker is actually in the event. And I like to sit next to the decision maker. So you know, after going through, say, a Greenbelt program with them, my relationship um, um, has exponentially increased over that three-month three period. And then 
be proactive about building your own network, not only within your college, but with other people who do similar things at other colleges and, and are successful. I think, uh, you know, the past year and a half as I've been working with around 18, 20 different colleges, I have learned a couple things from every single one of those colleges and have been able to kind of bring that with me as I work with colleges in the future. Uh, just wanted to tell you a little bit about the service, service offerings that we offer at Contract Training Ed, so we kind of break it down into three categories. One is on the consulting side where uh, we work with uh, leadership teams to really, for folks who are looking to build a business unit like this or to reorganize, we go in and do a thorough organizational assessment, data analysis, and ultimately come up with a recommendation report on items like structure, roles, responsibilities, strategy, service offerings, processes, things like that. Um, we do visioning workshops with leadership teams and do keynote presentations for both national and statewide conferences. Uh, from a team development, so these are intact teams at colleges. Uh, we do the uh, disk assessment profile and workshop, the business development strategy workshop, service offering portfolio workshop, and a process matching mapping workshop, which we talk about the entire process from initial and client engagement to the services are delivered, it's been invoiced and paid. And then from an individual development standpoint, uh, we offer a signature two-day strategy and solution selling workshop, which is really um, the collection of all the best practices and taking a deeper dive into all of them over two days. Um, do that both with intact teams and with um, in more of an open enrollment setting. We also do sales call shadowing and feedback, where we actually go on sales calls with you. We help you prepare for them, go on them, and then debrief afterwards and then one-on-one -on -one coaching, over, which is typically done over the phone. So those are the, the menu of services at Contract Training Edge. I'd like to leave you with a quote before we get to our questions that you may have. Uh, so my quote is, start anywhere and go everywhere. Um, focus less on the specific service you want to sell and focus more on the specific issues they, meaning the organizations that you're working with and targeting, want to address. And the start anywhere thing notion is that um, it's not necessarily HR. Or HR isn't the only door that uh, that's appropriate to go through when you're working these organizations, especially the large ones. It's been my experience of there are several different doors that you can go in within an organization, not only HR, but with a lot of the different line of business leaders within that organization. and. Uh, I have probably done more revenue working outside of the HR folks than I have with HR. So I've done most of my work with working with line of business leaders. So this, that, that's where this kind of quote comes into play. Is start anywhere within the organization and then build, do a pilot engagement, have it be wildly successful, and then go everywhere within that organization. If you, if you do that well, you'll find yourself doing a lot of those things I showed you on one of those earlier slides, selling that client multiple services, selling higher levels of revenue to that client, and then doing it year after year after year. If we can do that really well and have more top accounts, you're just going to have a portfolio of accounts that's frankly easier to manage and will gain higher levels of re re revenue. It worked for me. It works for other people that I've worked with, and it can work for you. Uh, I'd like to appreciate your time today, and I think this is where we're going to kind of open it up for questions. It absolutely is. So if you have some questions, and I've been holding a few for the very end, uh, go ahead and type them in the question and answer box, and I'll filter those to Greg. So first off um, was a question from the very beginning. Are there any clues for telling if your customer is a DIS or C? <laughs> Yes, there is, um, and you know we can't. Unfortunately, we can't ask our clients to complete a disk assessment prior to meeting with them, right? That's probably un unrealistic. So we have to get be good at client profiling and picking up on some cues, so that not even before the first meeting, but while you're in the meeting. So, for example, if uh, you in the process of setting up a meeting, and you say you're doing it via email, and you're going back and forth. If they're going back and forth with these one one word responses like yes or no or this time this date and they're not elaborating on anything, 
that's just a clue that they're probably on the left side of that circle. They're either a D or a C versus an I or an S. An I or an S will typically elaborate on things a little bit more, provide uh, um, uh, because they're, they're more inclined to want to build that relationship and tell a story. Uh, so that, that, that's a clue prior to the meeting. Now, once you're walking into a meeting, um, a question I like to ask is, because when I'm, you know, if I'm doing any intelligence on that person, like where they've worked for or which, how long they've been at that organization, if you open up with a question like, hey, John, you know, thanks for your time. Hey, I noticed that you used to work at Key Bank as a project manager. I mean, it's just kind of a, you know, call it a question or a comment, but you're kind of throwing your fish line out there and seeing how that person reacts to it. And I've asked, I've, I've, I've come out with that line to say, I, I noticed that you used to be a project manager at Key Bank back in, you know, the 2005 time frame. And they'll take that and, and go off on a 10, 15 minute story. And if they tell you a story, they're on the right side of that circle. They're, they're typically a high eye. Uh, if they're going into a deep level story about what, or if they say something like, yeah, I was there in 2005, and, that's, and then they stop. <laughs> they don't say anything. That's your cue to ask the next question. But that's also a clue that they're on the left, stand, the left side of that circle, and they're either going to be a D or a C. So there's lots of cues, and it, it does take a lot of practice, I will tell you that. But it really starts with you understanding yourself really well, and then getting familiar with the styles, and then start to, you know, for lack of a better term, you have to almost start to stereotype folks. And you're going to collect more data from that person the more often you connect with them. And you're not going to be right 100% of the time. But um, this is a lot better than going in blind and only having one approach to engage a client. So um, that was a great question. hope I answered it at least a little bit. And it, I guess my, 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 my quick answer is it takes a lot of practice. Okay. Uh, next question, do you ask your clients permission to use their name in your marketing materials? How do you handle that? Absolutely. You, you do need their, their permission um, to use both, not only their name, their, their, the language that they provide if you're going to put it on uh, some type of a testimonial. Um, and, you know, usually when I do videos, I get not only my decision makers buy-in, but then you, got, you typically have to get their marketing department involved. Because you know it's a video that's likely going to end up on YouTube, and you just you know they're going to have a vested interest in knowing that um, the end product is something that they feel good about. So absolutely, you want to you want to get their permission for that. All righty. Um, do you charge for data collection? Uh, Great question. Like conducting the focus group surveys or the interviews, do you charge for that type of thing? Great question, and it depends on who you ask. <laughs> Um, I, I, you know, at, at Tri-C, at my college, we probably charge for that 50% of the time. And then I, as I work with colleges, some are very animate about charging it for 100% of the time, and others are, hey, we do, that's part of what we do is, is the business development process. So I would say it's a, it's a, it's an opportunity by opportunity call for you. You know, if you can get them to pay a couple thousand dollars for that, that, you know, day, day and a half worth of work for one of two people to do that needs analysis. I say go for that, but then if there's a lot of pushback on that or they're hesitant about opening up their organization to that level because they, A, don't see the value in it right away or not willing to pay for it, there have been times that I chose to do it at no charge just to get um, have a much higher percentage chance at winning that, that opportunity. So I've done it both ways, and I, I would say it's about 50-50. I always kind of try and go for it and charge it, but as soon as I hear that it's not going to happen, I'd rather, and, and this is, I, and I say this because I got, I got good at doing this myself, so I, you know, it was worth my time doing, um, but I wouldn't do it for everyone. You know, if, it, if the nature of the opportunity was, was big where, say, you're looking at an opportunity that could involve a couple hundred people, to, to be trained and you're just trying to carve out a pilot group of say 15 and do what you want to do it the right way, those are scenarios where I'd be more inclined to do it at no charge. That being said, I'm going to, go, I'm going to try and charge them right off the bat. And if that's the pushback, I'm going to do it anyway for free. Great, great question though. Okay. 
And, and here's probably my favorite question of the hour. And it comes from Rod. He wants to know, is it possible to wean clients of state-funded grants uh, and get them off of the state-funded grants and pay for them themselves <laughs> with some corporate funding? Yeah. I had a, uh, and I intentionally over my 10 years at the college uh, try to work with very few clients where grants are involved because what happens, the dynamic of the grant creates um, a sense of uh, entitlement by the organization. So they get what I call addicted to the grant. And what, what happens is they love doing training with you when there's grant money involved, but as soon as that dries up or goes away, it's very, very difficult for them to get a reach into their pockets and pay for it 100%. In fact, I've never seen it. I probably had five clients I've worked with over 10 years where grants were involved. And at some point, it dried up with all five of those, and I didn't do business with any of them afterwards. And I don't think that's I don't think that's a coincidence. That being said, it's hard to turn down a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of money. So, you know, you you, you got to have your I call it your grant clients, and then your and then your top accounts. And your your top accounts are the ones that are going to be your bread and butter because they're not impacted by grants. But you also want to take advantage of some grant money too. So, I. We kind of had a grant group within our college who dealt more with the grant, the grants, and um, we did less incumbent worker training with grants and more kind of open enrollment um, initiatives with grants. So my my team was kind of less involved based on our philosophy. So, but I, I can I you know I feel the pain of some of the clients that I'm working with who just told me that for fiscal year 2015 their grant initiative just got cut in half. So my reaction to that is we have to, you know, we have to have different value conversations with perhaps some different clients whom we may not have been working with in the past as grants to build that sustainable revenue stream that I know we're all hoping for. Great, great question, though. Yeah. Well, I think that's just about going to wrap us up. Um, I do want to say for those who ask that the PowerPoint will be posted along with the video on aceware.com. And so if you want to go back and review, it will absolutely be there. And uh, I I'd, be happy, I'd be happy to show the reference for that, Lori, if folks wanted to uh, get on. Uh, if you want to give me the show, I can show them exactly where it will be on our website, if that might be helpful, while you're doing the wrap-up here. I'm hoping I'm going to send it to you, so we'll try. Okay. We'll flip-flop. Greg, excellent job. And again, I am amazed. You were able to cover 10 points, give tons of information, to do that in the 45 minutes. So uh, again, props for an excellent uh, presentation. As anyone who's done webinars know that it, it takes a whole lot more work to do. Uh, you're not getting me yet, Lori, by the way. Okay. Um, although you could take over if yourself if that's easier. Anyone who knows webinars, that the shorter the webinar, the more work it goes into making it happen. And Greg, yeah, it was an excellent, excellent session. So, um, yeah, thanks for the feedback. And if anyone would like to have a discussion about any of the items that we talked about, or perhaps the possibility of my helping your college uh, with anything that was presented, certainly uh, reach out to me via phone, email, however, however you prefer. Right, and again, we'll get you back to that. I just wanted, I'm showing the Aceware website, and for those, whether customers or visitors, under the customers link is a link called Webinar Archive, and basically where we will put the webinar is under the, I think, Operations, and you'll note it'll show up in the Student Manager Operations Webinar Series, and you'll see the Love, Money, and Contract Training. There is also a contract training, um, and I have that, managing contract training and student manager. If you're interested in knowing how your student manager can help you with the contract training, there it is. So, Lori, you may give it back to Greg, and uh, again, put your contact info up, and we'll, uh, we'll tell people again, uh, thank you very much. Lori, I'll let you get back to uh, Greg if you'll get that. There you go. So, Greg's contact info. Um, again, uh, excellent job, Lori. Thanks for a great job of hosting. And Greg, we'll look forward to running into you at uh, future professional conferences. Thank you, Chuck, and happy selling, my friends. All righty. Thank you much, everybody. Have a great summer. It starts tomorrow. Bye-bye, everybody.